I've got a custom provisioner for my ESP32. When I'm in provisioning mode, I can attach my phone to the device, enter credentials, and then it attaches to the internet. My interface looks like this, but I'd rather it look like this. One of the best reasons to have your own custom provisioner is so that you can control the user interface, the HTML screens that you or your users are seeing. You want it to look good because other people are going to see it, and you want to control what information it takes. Editing your HTML in your firmware and then loading it onto your microcontroller and then checking the output in a browser is not the right way to be doing this. You can edit HTML on the fly, on the side, away from your project. And when it's done, when you're sure it looks like you want it to, then you can copy that text back into your firmware. Let me walk you through some tips to make your HTML development go a little bit more smoothly. I'm going to pull down the code from last week's video. This will be our starting point for today. We're going to take the provisioner as is and focus on the HTML that's included in the firmware. For more on how this provisioner works, check out the link in the upper right hand of your screen. This is last week's video where we go through and set up this basic provisioner in less than 100 lines of code. This is an Arduino IDE project, but all of the code here is absolutely Arduino IDE friendly. You'll see at the end that it will work in your Arduino IDE editor. In our main.cpp, we're including a provisioner, calling it, and then passing the credentials it produces to Wi-Fi Begin. We also have a web server that's listening for requests. The routes of our web server are returning some HTML pages. In this header file here, we're defining two variables. One is a config page that has some inputs to take SSID and password. The next is a save page that simply reports that we have successfully provided our credentials. I'll create a dev folder and add two new files here, a config HTML and a saved HTML. Then of course, you can guess I'll copy this code over to those files so that we can edit it. Notice this capital R quotes parentheses syntax. This is a C++ syntax that allows us to take the raw string inside of the parentheses and use it in our character buffer without having to put escape characters to include special characters. So I'll grab what's inside of the parentheses and copy it over for both of our files. If we open Windows Explorer and a new browser window, we can drag files into the browser to get them to open, except when I have this Google up, it kind of grabs it and takes it as search. So you have to specifically drag it into the address bar. That will work. And afterward, watch, save, you drag it to the window, and it opens saved. Now we have both files open. We can refresh and see how our edits take hold. First, I'm going to add some boilerplate. This is just telling the browser what type of file it's receiving. The ESP32 server won't give it the headers to know, so this is helpful. In the style tag, we can write regular CSS just like you would inside a CSS file. Let's set our background to red and show that this is controlling our page's style. Okay, we don't need that, but I do want to set my box sizing to border box. That is used to get a more intuitive sizing of the elements on our page and I'm going to change our font to Arial. Let's confirm we got that. I'll wrap our input labels in divs so we have more control over the styling. Spread things out a little bit. There you go. You see it on the left now. We get new lines after SSID and pass. I'll add a title in an H1 tag. Now, whether we put it in a div or an H tag, we still need to edit it because it's not going to be exactly how we want it but H1 gets us closer because I want it to be large. This is just my personal style. I like to put everything in a container. Usually if you're gonna be on mobile or desktop, it doesn't matter for pages like this. You can have a narrow column that takes information. So I'll just fix that right here. It's nice to put some background color in our different elements so that we can see how our changes affect them. Inside the form, we only have two types of elements, divs and inputs. Let's give those some structure here. Okay, my SSID and pass are not doing what I expect, so I'm gonna add some color and I can see that they don't have the margins they need to be centered. I'm gonna step away and continue to work this up without explaining everything. The purpose here is not to explain everything about styling or CSS, 
but to to show that you're a lot better off editing your file in a browser rather than uploading it to your microcontroller and stepping through the provisioning process to see what the page looks like. So that's tip number one. Take the HTML out of your firmware files, put them into separate files that you can open in a browser so that the edits you make in your text editor can be reflected immediately on the screen. Tip number two is get familiar with your browser's dev tools. Hit F12 on Windows for Mac it's something else and look what we get for a screen after jiggling it around a little bit to get it in shape. Notice that on the left we can select different devices in which to view our page. In all cases the title is too close to the screen so I'll go in and add some margin. This knocks it onto two lines. Let's come down to the bottom right. You've got some tools you can use. I'm going to pull this screen up and you can see the computed boxes. It shows you for the different elements how much padding or margin they have. And you notice 36 pixels on the outside. That's why my device provisioning doesn't fit on one screen. In CSS, when you've got two values in the margin directive, it refers to the top and bottom in both sides. If you add a third value, that middle value then dictates the size, which we're now setting to auto and device provisioning will find its own space and render on one line. After doing a little bit more touch up, I'm ready to use this file as is. So I'm going to grab the contents of config.html and paste it back into our firmware. We compile and then go through the motions. We have to grab that SSID on the phone and then open the page. And there you see our formatted config page. If we step through and add the credentials and save, it connects and we get this unformatted saved page. So we need to work on that. I'll overwrite our previous saved.html with the contents of our config HTML because it's got some CSS that we're going to want to recycle. We don't need the styling for these inputs because our saved page doesn't have any inputs. Let's get rid of the form. I'm going to try an H3 here and add a little message that we have successfully saved the credentials. And when we refresh the page, we now see this nice formatted saved page. This brings us to tip number three. It's very hard to bring in, say, a JPEG or some sort of picture file into your page, but, but SVGs are defined in code, and so they're very easy to place inside of your HTML. Here's a box stock smiley face. I'll add some styling to it, including some margin. And when we refresh, you see we've got a nice image we can view in our saved page. I'll copy this over to our firmware. And before we compile, I want to revisit the config.html. Tip number four is that we can put some nice guardrails in our inputs to bolster the user experience. I'll start with the require directive. Let's add it to our inputs. And you see, that in the browser, it won't let me proceed without giving values for those inputs. We can also add a max length. That's nice to help filter out errors. Let's add a type directive. The first one is text, but the second is password. And look how in the browser, when I type my password, it is hidden from sight. We can also add a placeholder So when we first access our page, there is a gray message in each of the inputs helping the user to understand what they should be providing. Lastly, you saw the names, for the SSID and password in the inputs. Those are the keys for the key value pairs that are passed to the server on the back end. We also want to add an ID with the same value. This is for the future. In the next few weeks, you're going to see where we can use 
a neat technology to provision our device, but we have to have our inputs identified with these same names. Speaking of foreshadowing, let's look at another technique for the future. If we had other fields like MQTT host or port, which we will, we might want to make it optional to even provide values. Instead of placeholder, if you give the input a value, that value will appear there as soon as the page is accessed. You could leave it as is or edit it. This is very helpful for when you're often going to use some default value, but may not always use that value. It's there typed out for you, but you can change it if you want to. Okay, so I'll delete this because we don't need it for now. And I'm going to change the password type to text instead of password because I don't mind seeing it as I type it. I want to copy the config HTML into a new page, instructions.html. This brings us to tip five. You can use redirects to shape the user experience. On this page, I'm not going to have inputs. I'm just going to log that there's an error and tell the user what they need to do. This is a pretty weak validation at this point, but it's only for demonstration's sake. What I want you to see is that we can do an on-click window.location.href and give it a route. This can send it to somewhere else in our server so that a different page is returned to the user. This is no longer an input, it's a button. I just want to confirm that the CSS is working. I'm going to paste this HTML into my firmware. Without compiling, we're going to tip number six, which is that you can validate your submissions in the code. I had this weak requirement that we have at least four characters. I don't think it's important for SSID and password because we can already make those required fields in the HTML. But for other values like auth keys or settings, you're going to want to validate in your code that you got the right values before you save them and use them. So for demonstration's sake, let's say if we don't have enough password length, we're going to re return the instructions page. We attach to provisioning. We open the page. And I will enter the right SSID, but an insufficiently long password. And we get this message. But we can click back, and it will take us back to our config page. Now when we do it properly, we get the saved page. This is the file structure I currently have here in my basic config folder. To make this work in Arduino, one option would be to copy these files over to the Arduino projects area. Instead of the lib folder, I would put the provisioner library inside of the standard Arduino libraries folder. And then instead of having a source main.cpp, we would need a folder name and a sketch name that matches it. That would be one option. But another option is to just have a folder with a sketch and then copy all of these library files into that project folder. I'll do that right here. I'll create the enhanced HTML folder and give it a sketch with the same name. Copy the contents of main over to that sketch and then copy the library files into that folder. This all should work in Arduino IDE. So I pull it up. Here are our different files. Go ahead and compile and rearrange the screen a little bit. So we got our phone on the left and we have our provisioner started on the right. I'll go into the phone, access that SSID, go to the web page. Enter the credentials. It connects, and so we are officially Arduino IDE friendly. Putting this up in GitHub, the link will be in the description. 
Okay, that's all for today. Subscribe if you're enjoying this content. I have several more coming out on provisioning that I'm getting into MQTT and Raspberry Pi. I'm Larry, have a good week. I'll see you in a little bit.